Okay, this morning we're going to be talking about the intraoperative experience. We'll continue on. I believe what we need to do is move to the post-op, right? The pre-op, because I don't think we finished that. So let me minimize this and get back to our pre-op experience. The, uh, just by way of announcements, there are um, the course evaluations where you evaluate this class are up and running. So make sure you go take care of that. Also remember the uh, final exam is on the 23rd. The exam four is on the 18th or the, uh, the 18th or the 16th. So just a couple of uh, things before we get started. Do you, what, what's your, uh, remember we have one class extra. Have you thought about where you would like to place that open date? We could, I've got two ideas for you. We could do it. Um, the open date could be you do your exam four on Monday uh, and then you have a Wednesday open and then you take your final the following Monday. So you'd have your exam four on a Monday, and then you'd have a whole week to your exam on a Monday. Or you could put the exam four on the 18th, and then have the Monday open to, to study on that. Think about that. OK, yes, Macy. The final will be as uh, in the uh, schedule, course schedule. It's, the, it's uh, Monday, I believe, on the 23rd. And I think it's at 10 o'clock, actually, Macy. But don't quote me on that. I believe it's at 10 to uh, uh, 12. But check the schedule, and, and the official schedule that's on course schedule undergrad, and check that. OK, everybody? So those are just some things we have to do. Uh, are all your papers back? Everybody got their, their paper back? OK, that's all set. So really, all you have is one exam and the final left. All righty? And now let's finish up uh, this management of peri-op experience pre-op. And I think we were, let's see if we can get to where we were. We had finished talking about the pre-op. OK. Did we do the, I'm um, sorry, messing up here, click the wrong thing. We talked about all these different complicated, different surgical histories. Did we get into the nursing history at all, the self-concept body image issues? I didn't think so. Okay, so let's talk, start there. All right, <clears throat> nursing history. This includes many of the items mentioned above but it tends to focus on the patient's experience related to the upcoming surgery. Now, what the surgeon does preoperatively is, preoperatively is make sure that the patient's ready for surgery. They're healthy enough, they're stable enough, uh, that all the uh, pre-preparation as far as diagnostics go are completed. That's their job. Our job as a nurse is to make sure that the patient understands what their experience is going to be. What's it going to be like to be a surgical patient? So we try to assess that as uh, far as that goes. The first thing we assess a lot is self-concept issues because surgery can be life-changing, either for the better or for the worse. But surgery can change your life. And, and many, most people are having surgery for the purpose of changing their life. Like they've had pain and they want the pain gone and surgery can do that. Or they've had problems with a particular organ functioning well, and they want it repaired so it can function well. Plastic surgery has a lot of expectations. So surgery has self-concept issues. Now, your self-concept, if you recall, is what you think about who you are. So your self-concept is the sum total of everything you think about yourself. Now, there are many surgeries that really impact self-concept issues. For example, imagine you're a baseball player and you're a pitcher and you're having surgery on your elbow, real common surgery. 
that if your whole concept of yourself is a professional athlete and they're doing surgery on your elbow that could end your career, that's a huge self-concept threat. So uh, for myself as a teacher, if I had laryngeal surgery, surgery on my larynx, my vocal cords, that would be a major self-concept issue because it would go directly to whether I could perform my job or not. So a lot of people, when they're having surgery, not only face the physical stresses, but there are all these psychological things that come into play too. And a lot of times your patient's reacting to that. So while they may be having vocal cord surgery, they're responding in a very negative, angry, or quiet, or depressed way, and you're trying to figure out what's going on. It's because they're concerned about how the surgery is going to affect their self-concept. Will I be able to work? Will I be able to be employed? Can I be a father, a mother, a husband? Uh, will I be able to be a professional in my vocation? Will I be a healthy person anymore? Or will I forever be in, an invalid? So surgeries have a lot of self-concept issues. And you have to give people time to talk about those because they found through evidence base that the recovery period and the functionality of the patient after surgery has a lot to do with how well you've resolved their self-concept issues before. Uh, body image issues are a type of self-concept that it relates specifically to how they view the body. One of the big surgeries, uh, some of the big surgeries that affect body image are amputations. If you have your knee, uh, your leg amputated below your knee for diabetic complications, that affects the way you view your body. Uh, breast cancer surgery certainly affects body image issues. Um, plastic surgery, a lot of those are body image issues. So you don't want to ignore those. If the nurse doesn't deal with these, I'm telling you nobody else is going to deal with them. So it's either you or nobody. Because physicians, surgeons, don't really spend the time talking on those because they assume we're going to be doing it. So we're part of a team. They assume we're going to be doing this. We assume they're going to be doing that. We've worked together. <clears throat> Fears and anxieties. Uh, they did a lot of studies back in the 70s and 80s on preoperative fear. And they related it to the dose of anesthesia necessary to put the person under. They related it to post-op complications. And they related it to speed of recovery and they related it to the amount of pain medication requested after surgery. So they related uh, fears and anxieties before surgery to anesthesia, dose, post-op complications, recovery time, and pain medication after surgery. So these are four variables that they studied in relationship to patients dealing with their fears and anxieties before surgery. And they found that the anesthesia dose could be reduced by around 25%. So they would use less of a dose of anesthetic agent to put the person under. Why would that be important? Why would it be good, can anybody think of why it might be good to reduce the dose of anesthesia? Any ideas? Martin, any ideas? Yeah, less of a body medication to metabolize. Courtney? Yeah, I mean, the, the recovery would be so much faster. It would be 25% faster. And the rule of anesthesia is use as little anesthesia as necessary to bring them to the level of sedation needed. And if you can decrease that by 25%, that's, it's enormous. Post-op complications, they were reduced. This doesn't sound like much, but they were reduced by about 18%. But if you think about it, that's just fears and anxieties dealing with those and reducing those were correlated with reduction in post-op 
post-op complications in 18% of people. That's actually a lot. It doesn't sound like much, but it really is. Recovery time, uh, they didn't get a statistical average on that, but it was shortened in most cases. And the pain met after surgery was the biggest thing, and that was it was reduced by about 30%. People's asking for pain meds after surgery. Because we know that a person's emotional state and their anxiety directly relates to how they perceive pain. The more anxious and fearful you are, the more you relate to pain. Have you ever, maybe you're not old enough like me, you're definitely not as old as I am, but have you ever had a pain and you were worried about what it was? You thought, oh my goodness, is that in whatever it, that is? And so you got really upset about it, and you took pain meds, and it didn't work as you took more. But have you ever, ever had pain where you go, oh, that's just what happens to me after I run? And you don't even take a Tylenol. Does that make sense? What pain do you think I pay real close attention to and makes me really ang anxious? Chest pain. <laughs> you know, at my age, if I have chest pain, I'm scared. And then that makes, I take more pain, I take Tylenol, I, I start taking aspirin, you know, to anticoagulate myself, self-treat like we nurses do, you know. So uh, I get anxious about that. But if I have a pain in my knee, I just figure I'm just old, you know, and so it doesn't, I don't care about it. So my anxiety about a heart attack makes me pay attention and stay up all night over a pain in the chest that I would rank as a one on a scale of one to 10. But I could have a five in my knee and not even take pain meds and I would sleep because of the anxiety and the nervousness about the implications of the pain itself. Well, that's exactly what's happening when you have post-pre-op teaching. When patients understand their fears and their anxieties and they address them, then the pain after the surgery doesn't mean that negative interpretation that it would have had otherwise, and they request less pain medication. So it's really huge, it's an enormous thing. Does anyone happen to know what the number one fear related to surgery might be? Any ideas? What would have people's general public's number one fear related to surgery? Any thoughts? Rebecca, anything you've got? Yeah, they do fear waking up a lot. They'll always ask you, what happens if I wake up during surgery? Because they don't want to wake up during surgery. Uh, they won't remember it even if they do. And that's probably what a good response is. Well, if you do, you won't remember it. You know, it'll be gone in a minute, and the anesthesiologist will have you sedated in, in seconds. But that isn't the number one fear. It's very common, though. very good. Megan? Yeah, not waking up after surgery. They're always afraid of that. But that isn't number one. Those are all excellent ones. You'll hear all of those every day when you work surgery. The number one fear is fear of the unknown. You'll say to them, about what are you afraid? And they don't know. And you say, well, can you tell me exactly of what you're afraid? I, I don't, I'm not really sure. I'm just anxious. I'm just nervous. I, I think something will go wrong. What will go wrong? I don't know. And they don't know what to expect. Now, <clears throat> here's the problem. If they've never had surgery, they have a fear of the unknown because they don't know what's going to happen. If they've had surgery, their fears are going to be all the things that happen negatively with the first surgery, which may have nothing to do with the second surgery. So you're always going to have to deal with their fears. And we, the nurse, are the one who deals with the patient's fears. Now, how do you do it? You listen to them. Remember, active listening. Ask them about their fears. Ask them about their concerns. Do it over and over again. Because a lot of people, the first time you ask them, tell me your fears about this surgery, they'll say, oh, it's nothing. No, I'm not afraid. So then you ask them again. And they say, well, no, I'm, I'm not really, really afraid. Well, are you anxious? Well, maybe a little anxious. What are you anxious about? Well, nothing really big. Oh, OK. Then you ask them a third time, uh, do you have any fears, what, any fears or anxieties at this time about surgery? Well, well you know, I am afraid about. And, and so you have to bring it up several times so they have permission to, excuse me, permission to talk about it. Uh, especially people that are very stoic, people who don't want to uh, admit that they're having any kind of symptoms, people 
who are very secretive, uh, people who are very private. Uh, you want to give them ample opportunities to talk about their fears and their concerns. <clears throat> Another thing that you're, you're going to want to do is any complaints that they have or actual physical concerns. One of the things that uh, I experienced once, this, one, this woman was extremely anxious before her gallbladder surgery, extremely anxious. Uh, every time I walked in the room, she was nervous, fidgeting. Her pulse was up. Her respirations were up. And I could tell that she was going to need a lot of anesthesia to calm her down and put her under. She's going to be a very difficult case for anesthesia. And as a nurse, pre-op nurse, you'll, you'll learn to know what those behaviors are. You'll see that anxiety, tachycardia, uh, rapid shallow breathing, dilated pupils, nonsensical, repetitive motor movements. And you'll see those and you'll know that they're going to be a tough case to anesthetize. And you'll see that, so you want to go for what's the reason for that. Because if you can deal with that, then the anesthetist has a much easier time sedating them during surgery. So this lady was exhibiting all those behaviors. And I said to her, uh, can you tell me what, you, you seem anxious. Can you tell me about what you're anxious? And she says, oh, well, nothing really. And I said, well, what would be the worst thing that could happen from this surgery? And sometimes that's a good way to go and ask them, what's the worst thing that could happen? And she said, well, I could die. And I said, OK, got it. I said, what would be the second worst thing? And then she said something I had never heard, because at that time I'd been a nurse for 15 years. And she said, I'm afraid of my husband seeing me without my false teeth. And I said, can you? talk a little bit more about this. She says, we've been married for 30 years, and he's never seen me without my false teeth in. And I don't want him to see me without my false teeth in, because I'm really ugly without my false teeth. Note, everybody's ugly without their false teeth, OK? So but she was really particularly into it. And so uh, I worked with her, and I said, OK, well, here's what we're going to do. And we devised a plan for her teeth to go down with her. We talked to all the pre-op people. I accompanied her down there. We got everything all set. And uh, after we did the plan, explained the plan, how it was going to happen, and how we were going to get her teeth back in before her husband ever came up to see her, and had it all arranged and everybody communicated with, she just calmed down. And actually, the next time I went in the room, she was sleeping. She had fallen asleep because she'd been up all night worrying about what? Her husband seeing her without her false teeth. So since we took care of that, she actually fell asleep, and I thought, oh, I wonder if they're even going to have to anesthetize her, because she's already out, because she's been up all night. So that's what happens. And see, that's how a nurse makes a difference between things. And you say, well, that's, does that happen all the time? Well, not about false teeth, but it happens every day, all the time, with all kinds of patients in hospitals as nurses deal with them. So you really have to look at that. What are their concerns and their complaints? Look at their coping resources, how they dealt with stress before, because surgery is a stressor. A good way is just to ask them, how do you deal? Have you ever had surgery before? Yes. How did you deal with it then? What were some issues that came up? Have you ever had surgery before? They say no. Then you start asking about accidents and uh, crises that have happened. How have you dealt with it before? Uh, their culture, a lot of different, uh, there's differences in cultural ways of dealing with pain. Uh, make sure that you look at their expectations. Expectations are huge. It will never cease to amaze you the expectations that patients have for surgeries. They think that their surgery is going to cure every problem they had. They think it's going to be the silver bullet that makes them able to run a 100-meter dash in 10 seconds when they couldn't even do it when they were 18. They just have super high expectations for surgery. What's the problem when expectations are not met? What do you think? You, what's the big danger of inappropriate expectations for operative patients? Any ideas? Disappointment, anger. Yeah, anger, disappointment. A lot of times they'll get so angry and disappointed they'll quit with the regimen. They'll just quit. Uh, one of the things that if you have orthopedic surgery, one of the things is that gruesome rehabilitation situation. It just takes a long, long, long time. And you, when you're rehabbing joints, you have to stick with it for a long time. 
I'm talking months. But if you had expectations that you were going to get up and be able to walk without pain up and down stairs a day after surgery, and that was your expectation, when that does not happen, then you start quitting in the rehab because the rehab isn't living up to your expectation. And you have to make sure that their expectations are realistic. So you actually ask them, what do you expect from this surgery? What do you actually expect it to do for you? And you're going to find some very unrealistic expectations. And so then you have to deal with those. Now, who do you think you'd call if a patient has very unrealistic expectations for their surgery? Who would you call? Doctor. Yeah, which doctor? Uh, whoever's <laughs> referring them to the surgery, I would think. Yeah, the surgeon, the main surgeon. Call the surgeon. Don't call the anesthesiologist. Don't. And in fact, it's not even your job to say, no, now, now, Jacob, I don't think those are realistic expectations. Most people will have this because I'm not doing your surgery. I didn't see your CAT scans, your MRIs. I don't know. And see, if I am not accurate, what have I just set up? A new set of false expectations for them. So you, the nurse, you don't, you assess that they have false expectations, but you do not correct them. It is the job of the surgeon to come up and correct them. Now, will the surgeon come up and correct them? Probably not, because the surgeon is probably busy, has a hundred other cases going on, so they will send their PA, their physician's assistant, or their, their resident, or their intern. But your job is to make sure that that person comes up and talks to these, this client before they go to surgery, and you document that that was done. In fact, I would even document what the unrealistic expectations are in the official medical record. Client says, I can't wait to ride my bike 10 miles next week after knee surgery. You see, that needs to be somewhere because that's totally unrealistic. The knowledge of the procedure. You ask them, tell me what is going to be done. In your own words, you tell me what is going to happen, what is the surgeon going to do, and why are they doing it? Because there again, Many times you'll get very strange answers, very strange answers, because people misinterpret all the time. And when they're anxious, they misinterpret more. So the very fact that they're having surgery in the next 24 hours makes them not hear clearly. Have you ever been in a situation where you're really afraid, anxious, and nervous, and somebody's saying something, and all you hear is wah, 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 like Lucy? Charlie Brown's feature, or everybody with face masks. That's all you hear. You can't hear anything. And then they leave and you say, what did, what did they say? Has anyone ever had that kind of experience? Well, your pre-op patients all have that. One of the experiences you'll have that relates to this is your first job as an RN. You'll call a physician, healthcare provider, and you'll ask them. You'll report, and they'll give you some orders over the telephone. And you'll repeat them back. And then you'll hang up, and guess what? You can't remember what they said. And you just repeated it back because you were anxious, you were nervous. It was the first time calling a physician uh, on the phone for orders. So just like you need rehearsal and repetition, they will need rehearsal and repetition about what is being done. Now, if they tell you erroneous information about the surgery, and you go, whoa, that is not what is going to be done, then who do you call? the surgeon. Why do you not correct it yourself? Because you aren't the one doing the surgery and you don't, you don't really even know exactly what's going to be done. You know generally what's going to be done, enough to know that their statement seemed false, but you then call the surgeon. You say, do, are you, I talked with Mr. Jones, this is what they said was being done. Is that the understanding you wish them to have? And they'll say no. And then they'll say, what, if, what would you do if they said this to you, Megan? Well, you go tell them that I'm going to do this, 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 and this. What would you say, Megan? <laughs> you know, I mean, the surgeon says to you, you're talking on the phone to the surgeon. 
and you tell them that the patient said this erroneous view of what was going to be done. And you know, and he says, the surgeon, the healthcare provider says, tell the patient that I'm going to do this, 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 and this. What would you, what do you think you should say? So if you got a question on an exam like that, how many in here would answer, tell the patient word for word what the doctor said? How many would pick that answer? Okay, you're not going to pick that answer. You're going to pick the answer that says what? Could you please have someone come in to explain the surgery to this person because the informed consent, and we're going to talk about that, is not valid now because they are ill-informed. So you've got to get the other person in there. Now, do healthcare providers that are surgeons, do they like to be called on the telephone with inter No, because they're busy. They hate it. So just understand, you're doing something they don't like. <laughs> so that's why we earn the huge paycheck that we nurses get choked. Um, but that's where we get our hazard pay. OK, physical exam. So that's, those are emotional, social things we assess, which are equally important. I put those first because I want you to not overlook them. Okay, the physical exam, what does the nurse do? Well, you look for any evidence of cardiac or pulmonary compromise. Why? Because remember, during surgery, we are altering their heart and we're altering their lungs. We're intubating them. We may be knocking out their diaphragm, paralyzing it so they can't breathe, and we are going to be breathing with, for them through the machine. That's abnormal. Whenever you do anything abnormal with what God created, you get issues. And so even though we have really good mechanical ventilators, they're not designed for the lungs God created. So you get issues. So we need to make sure that they're not, for example, they may have had great clear lungs yesterday, afebrile. They come in for surgery at 6 o'clock in the morning, and they have a cough. And they didn't have the cough when the physician examined them yesterday. You need to pick up on that and, and report that. Inspect every inch of the skin's surface. The reason why we do that is because in this day and age, there are two things that drive this. Surgery is done for hours on a table. You're on there for an hour, two hours, three hours on a hard surface about this wide and about this hard. And the patient's lying on that table. And they're not moving at all. So they might actually lie on their arm the wrong way for four hours. And they might actually develop a sore or a, a break in skin integrity during that time. Or they may actually be nicked by a scalpel or burned by a bovi cauterizer. And we need to document that those, scar, those uh, wounds were or were not there before surgery. See, we need to know what their skin was like before surgery so that if anything abnormal shows up after surgery, we know whether it was there before or it happened during surgery. Now, why do we care if it happened during surgery? Because if it happened during surgery, the hospital has to pay that cost for the, for the treatment of that wound. It's totally free for the patient, totally free for the insurance company, totally free for Medicare. The hospital has to eat the cost. So the hospital wants to make sure that if somebody had a pressure sore on their ankle, that it, was, that it was documented that it was there before surgery so we don't have to pay for it. And then the other side of it is litigation, suing, lawsuits, so that we know that if there were any nicks or cuts or scars or red areas before surgery, those are documented. So you actually have on the operative, on the pre-op report, there's always a little uh, Pillsbury Doughboy, we call them. It's a little more anatomically correct than that. But it will say, this is the front, and then they'll have another one with the back. And you have to put like this, you have to put ulcer, you put number one, and then you put number two, and then you put number three, and then you put number four. And you have to then in the nurse's notes in the document, document what number one is. And then you have to tell about number two, then number three, then number four. And you have to do, do you remember old CART, that acronym old CART? 
So you have to do all of that. You have to assess the location, the qu characters, the qualities, the, the, the size, the depth, any drainage, any aggravating, alleviating factors. You have to really describe it as, as uh, specifically and exactly as you can. All right. Every single surface. All righty? So that takes some time. And for some people, you know, could you imagine if somebody's going to surgery to uh, correct a lung injury that was caused by a motorcycle accident where they laid the motorcycle accident down because a motorist wasn't looking and they slid 40 feet? Can you imagine all of the cuts and bruises and abrasions those people are going to have? <laughs> you have to. You have to account for all of that. And if somebody is having surgery after a burn, you have to account for all of those burns and everything. So this may take, I mean, at, at the extreme, it could take two nurses for a half hour. Two nurses working full time a half an hour to document all of this. At the other extreme, it's a five minute check. But don't overlook it. Because I guarantee you, the time you overlook it and you say, I've done this, I've done this assessment a hundred times and nobody's ever had anything of note or importance. So I think I'm just going to skip that right now. The day you decide to do that is going to be the patient that has a pre-surgical skin integrity issue. And, and so don't ever do it. All right, um, examine the abdomen. Does anybody know why we want to know the bowel sounds and the, the firmness of the abdomen? Does anybody know why we might want to know that before surgery? Yes, Laura. Like like yes, because surgery is a stressor, and stressors trigger the sympathetic nervous system. Remember that? And the sympathetic nervous system shuts down the bowel. So it decreases peristalsis, decreases GI secretion, and literally shuts your bowel down. So I want to know, did they have bowel sounds before surgery? So that if they don't have them after, I know it's a change. Or did they ha have them or not have them before? So we, I need a baseline, a baseline for parasympathetic uh, blockade. I think, Laura, that's what you were talking about, parasympathetic blockade after surgery. All right, um, assess neurostatus. Why? Well, you need a baseline. What if they have a stroke during surgery and you did not do a neuro assessment before? Do you see how dangerous that is? I remember one nurse got all upset about a patient she had. I, I was working with her and the patient came back from PACU and the patient couldn't talk well. She was very dysarthric. And the nurse was all upset. And so I happened to uh, see the family member walking in and so I talked to the family member. And I said, you know, he's dysarthric. And they said, yeah, he's been dysarthric for 10 years after a previous stroke. So, I mean, she was all freaking out because this patient had, was having a difficulty speaking after the surgery, and it was a 10-year-old problem. So make sure that you know those, neurostatus. Now, what's a, the best way to do a neurostatus exam? Do you remember from last semester? What are some good ways to assess a patient's neurological status? some tools we have. Orientation. Okay, orientation. But think of a scale. Is there a scale, Gerard, that we could use? Have you heard of the Glasgow Coma? How many have heard of the Glasgow Coma Scale? Okay, there we go. Glasgow Coma Scale, remember it measures best eye response, best verbal response, best motor response. Okay, and you get a score. Does anybody know what, what's the max score on a Glasgow Coma Scale? 15. What's the lowest score? Three. You get a one on everything. Okay. So wouldn't it be nice to have a Glasgow Coma Scale on every patient before surgery? Then you could compare it afterward. All righty. So Gerard, you're absolutely correct about orientation, but see, a Glasgow Coma Scale score would be much more uh, comprehensive, and it gives us a nice numerical comparison. Immediately after surgery, what do you think people's Glasgow Coma Scales might be? Can you give me a number? 
Abigail, anybody? Yeah, it would be between four and six. Why would I say six and lower? Does anybody know why I might say six and lower? What's the significance of six on a Glasgow coma? What's the last word of that scale? Uh, uh, not the second word. Glasgow coma scale. So a six is a coma and under, non-responsive. So during surgery, don't do we not in during surgery, do we want them to have a response to pain? No, we don't want their arms moving if they have a painful stimulation. Do we want them to be opening their eyes? No. Do we want them to be speaking? No. So we want, you know, ones and twos on those responses. So we're going to, we want them to be in a coma. Although it's technically not a coma, it's an anesthesia state. So all of these are pretty much baseline things. Okay, now other things. Diagnostic and lab screening. These are very important. <coughs> the first one is a type and cross match. What is a type and cross match for Chloe? Uh, other Chloe. Um, Macy. Jacob. Type and cross. Type. Blood type. Type. Yes, blood type. A blood. A type and cross match is you're typing the blood. You want to know is it A, B, A, B, or O? Correct. We want to know your blood type. You know the reason why we want to know the blood type. Why is that, Kylie? Um, so if we have the right like, donor blood or like, we're getting the right blood to the right person. Yeah, compatibility. Are we, are, are we giving compatible blood to the patient? Because we don't want to give incompatible blood because that could kill them. So we want to make sure if we give a transfusion, and why are transfusions routinely done in surgery? Because surgeries, you lose blood, right? Surgery causes bleeding. Bleeding causes blood loss. Blood loss is treated with a transfusion. You want to make sure that it's the right type of blood. So when your blood is typed, that's what it means. They take your blood and they check on the antigens on the surface of the cells and they make sure you're whether you're A, B, B, A, or O. So what's A mean? You have A antigen on your RBCs. What's B mean? You have B antigens. What's A, B? You have both A and B antigen. What's donor mean? What's O mean? You have no antigen on your blood. So if you have no antigen on your blood, if I have no antigens on my blood, zero, meaning I'm type O, type O blood, I have no antigen on my red blood cells, can you take my blood? I have no antigen. Why? Is it Universe donor, donor. You donor. We're your yeah. universe donor because if I don't have antigen, what are we worried about with blood? Incompatibilities, right? Incompat incompatibilities means there's an antigen antibody reaction. So that incompatibility is an antigen antibody reaction. Antigen antibody reaction, incompatibility, clumping, patient dies. Okay? If you've got no antigen, can the antibodies in their body have a reaction to anything? No. So all of you could take O because O has no antigen. So it's not going to trigger any kind of an antigen antibody response. So who cares about incompatibility? All right? And O negative, particularly, because what does negative mean? Did you study that in anatomy? What's, what's that got to do with? The rhesus, the RH factor. So not only are you having no A or B antigen, you've got no RH antigen either. So you're O negative. So that's what blood banks want. They want O negative blood because they can give it to anybody at any time. But what about an AB, AB positive? They can only get, wait, no. AB positive can get any blood. Because if they're A, do you understand this? A person has no antigens 
to what they have because you're not going to be allergic to yourself. So if you have A, you're not going to have A antigen. If you have B, you're not going to have B antigen. And if you have RH, you're not going to have RH antigen. So A, B positive, you have no antigen. So if I put antibody in you, you've got no antigen. I mean, if I, let me put it this way. This is antigen. <laughs> this is antibody. OK, got it? OK. Uh, with AB, I've got no antibodies. So I can put any antigen into you I want, and you will not have a reaction. O blood, O people, have no antigen. You see, so they don't have any antigen. So they, they're, they're not going to trigger an antibody in anybody else. So O is a universal donor, and a AB positive is a universal recipient. So how many of you in here have AB positive? How many don't know what type you are? It's probably good as a nurse to get that done, uh, just for fun. Just, well, just to know. Uh, is it, so nobody is AB positive? Anybody A? B? O? Okay, yeah. <clears throat> so we O's are the donors. <clears throat> now we do need A and B blood as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now that's a type. Does anybody know what a cross match might be? Anybody at all have know what a cross match is? Because this will be on the next exam. Cross match. Okay, what they do is let's say that I'm an O negative blood and I donated, so the unit of blood is O negative. And Colton is A positive. Colton can get my blood, can't he? Because there's no antigen in my in the blood, my blood to for his antibodies to react to. Got it? So just because we our types seem to be compatible, the healthcare industry wants to be sure. So what they do is they take a little bit of Colton's blood and a little bit of my blood and they mix it together in a test tube to see if there is any agglutination or clumping. Making sense? Just, as a, just to make sure. Theoretically, Colton should have no trouble with my O blood. Shouldn't have a problem at all. But just because things are true in theory doesn't mean they're always true in real life. Because maybe there's some other antigen that we're not looking for in my blood that would trigger a reaction in Colton. Maybe there's a C or a D or an E or an F that we don't even know about. So uh, we will do a cross match, a type and cross match. Now, that type and cross match is only good for 48 hours. And you want to write that down. A type and cross match is only good for 48 hours. And you say, well, why is that? Are their blood types going to change? Is their antigen antibody status going to change? No. No. That, if, if Colton's type and cross match says my blood is a good blood for him to donate, to give to him, then it's always going to be true. It doesn't, my, his status in antibodies doesn't change. My antigen status doesn't change. The reason why it's good for only 48 hours is blood banks don't like to tie up a unit of blood for longer than 48 hours. Because once we do the type and cross match, the blood bank actually pulls two units of O blood out of their blood bank and puts it in a reserve refrigerator for Colton. So no one can touch that blood except Colton for 48 hours. After 48 hours, if you haven't used it, it gets put back in the main refrigerator. So if you want to give, give him more blood, you have to go through the whole procedure again. So, you only, so if you have a patient whose surgery is delayed, as a nurse, you always want to check when the type and cross was done. Because the last thing you want to do is check off that they have a type and cross match done, but it's so old that it doesn't apply anymore. So when the guy starts bleeding on the table and they call for the blood in the blood bank, what's going to happen? There won't be any blood available. So that's a big thing for you to do. And it really is your job. That's one of the things that nurses make sure is done. 
Okay, an EKG for those over 40, we talked about this before. Anybody over 40, I don't care if they have no history of health, dis heart disease, they're gonna have an EKG drug done. Uh, CXR, that means chest X-ray. We wanna make sure that their lungs are clear. Anybody with a cold or bronchitis or pneumonia is a high risk for surgery and we might even cancel it until they get a round of antibiotics. So you want a chest X-ray. A complete blood count is the next one, CBC. Complete blood count. Now this has three parts, and this is something for you to remember. I think we talked about it a little bit before, but I wanna make sure you guys don't go into your junior year not knowing CBCs are comprised of three major things. A white cell evaluation, a red cell evaluation, and a platelet evaluation. Whites, reds, platelets. Whites, reds, platelets. That's what a CBC contains. It's a complete blood count, and the complete means you have all three, white, red, and platelet. Now the funniest thing about it is, it's, 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 I don't know, it's, there's a lot of things like this in the world of uh, merchandising. It's actually cheaper for the patient to have a CBC done, complete blood count, when you need a platelet count. All you need is their platelet count. Well, if you order a platelet count, that's twice the price as if you order a complete blood count and you'll get the whites and reds for free. I don't, I don't understand that, but I suppose some of you that had marketing experience would understand it. So we do a lot of CBCs even though we may not need all of them. Okay, what do the whites check for? Real quickly, what do the whites assess for? Inflammation and infection. So we don't wanna do surgery on people with active infections. So how do we rule that out? the white count. So we want the white count to be under 11,000 per cubic millimeter. Remember that, 11,000? So the minute your CBC comes back and you see 18,000, uh, you should be thinking something's not right here. Okay, the red blood cells, we want them to be four to six million per cubic millimeter. Four to six million, they're much more uh, frequent and populous. If it's below four, they're anemic. Remember we talked about what anemia does for surgery. They might need a transfusion before surgery. And platelets have to do with clotting, correct? Platelets have to do with clotting. What role do platelets play in clotting? Michaela, do you know the role that platelets play in clotting? They help like aggregate. They aggregate. Okay, and when they aggregate, that means to clump. And when they clump, they form a barrier. Now, what role does fibrin and fibrinogen and thrombin and prothrombin play in clotting? Gerard? The thrombin the does. The thrombin does, but the fibrin comes before. Fibrin comes before, platelets, then thrombin. And he, Gerard says they, they sort of consolidate the clot. That's what thrombin does. Does anybody know what fibrin does? Fibrin makes a mesh. Have you heard the fibrin mesh? How many have heard that phrase, the fibrin mesh? Okay, so what happens is when you have a, a bleeding area in a blood vessel, the fibrin comes in, and it makes a mesh over the area that's broken. Like if you lacerate an artery, it will make a mesh over the cut areas. Okay, so that's the mesh. And a platelet is about, let's say, let's say a platelet's about that size. So if you had a blood vessel, right here, that was, that's the hole, that's the opening. You see the platelet would not, it would just go right on through. But the fibrin, the fibrin mesh turns this into that. So you, what you do is you build sort of like a spider web across the hole, and then when the platelets come, 
instead of just passing right on through, they would clot there. They would get stuck like a fly on a spider web. And then another plate would come along and get caught there, and another plate would get caught there, and another plate would get caught, caught there. And so what it is is the fibrin provides the mesh in which the platelets will aggregate. And then the thrombin comes over and kind of makes it a nice smooth uh, closure of the opening of the wound. So you've got your platelet aggregation on your fibrin mesh. Now, fibrin mesh doesn't do anything if there aren't enough platelets. And platelets can't do anything if there's not enough fibrin. So you need both fibrin and platelets. Now, you might ask me, why don't we do fibrin and fibrinogen tests before surgery? Why don't we do that? Why do we just do platelets? Because in the human body, the way disease happens, it's very rare for a person to have a fibrin deficiency, a fibrin problem. Because the body can make fibrin really quickly out of the amino acids in the liver and just do just fine, unless you have advanced liver disease. Remember we talked about the risk, remember liver disease risk? What was that? Does anybody remember? What level risk was liver disease for surgery? What was that? Plus, plus four risks, yeah, four plus risk. Because you can't make your fibrin. If you don't make your fibrin, who cares about your platelets? They're just gonna go out your body. So fortunately for us, God's design is so amazing that it's very rare for the fibrin mesh system to, to be compromised. And, and that's the hard one to, to fix. The platelets, you just give them extra platelets and they're fine. All right, so that's what a CBC does. Uh, electrolytes, now we just finished electrolytes, a unit on electrolytes, okay? So why do we want to know their potassium level? What does that assess? Potassium level, why, do we, why are we worried about that? What's the big organ we're worried about? Heart, because remember, if your potassium's high, what happens to your heart? It stops. If your potassium's low, your heart speeds up. So you've got to have a normal electrolyte. Uh, coagulation studies, these are ones that involve the thrombin and the fibrin. If they felt you had a disease that was a coagulation factor disease, uh, let me give you, you'll study this next year in the junior year. Well, actually, you'll study it this summer for you guys. Is you'll learn about hemophilia. How many have heard of hemophilia? That's a coagulation disorder that involves fibrin and fibrinogen and thrombin and prothrombin. It's not a platelet problem. So hemophilia would be a strong reason not to have surgery. Creatinine, what, is, what are we measuring there? Um, Rachel, what are we measuring when we measure creatinine? Kidney function, exactly, we measure kidney. And uh, Jacob, why do you think we worry about the kidneys? Because uh, if the kidney shut down, the whole body will shut down. Okay, if the kidney shut down, what related to surgery is going to be a problem? Think about the role of the kidneys during surgery. What what should the what do you think a primary function of the kidneys is in the surgical experience of the patient? Think about pharmacologically in farm you learned. What's the role of the kidney in pharmacology? Rebecca? Excreting. Yeah, which is probably too obvious. <laughs> Whenever I ask a question of the obvious answer, it's always the hardest one. Yeah, because so if you have a kidney problem, are you going to excrete the anesthetic agent? No. So if you don't excrete the anesthetic agent, it's gonna stay active for a longer period of time and they're gonna come out of the anesthesia a lot slower. It might be hours till they become alert. So you've gotta have a good kidney to excrete the anesthetic agent. And then liver enzyme tests, okay. Now, knowing if creatinine is important pre-op because it tells you how well the kidney's gonna be able to excrete the anesthetic agent, what do liver enzymes tell you? Rebecca. Yes. 
how well is the patient going to be able to metabolize the anesthetic agent. Now the one we use the most is ALT. It's a uh, And the A just escaped me what the A meant, but it's got a, it's got a big long name. So it's a uh, something lactodehydrogenated transaminase. That's what it stands for. But I don't want you to learn that. Whenever I see you see that, I want you to think A a liver test. It's a lot easier to remember thinking, oh, ALT is a liver test. And that way you'll know what it actually measures. So that's your primary liver analyzer. Now there are a couple others, SGPT, SGOT, and those are also liver enzymes. But the big one is the ALT. Let's talk about physical and emotional preparation. What are the things you do before they go to surgery? Well, what you have to do is make sure they're NPO. Nothing per os, nothing by mouth. And the studies show, all the evidence shows, that before surgery, all you have to do is be NPO for four hours. But surgeons, healthcare providers, and hospitals have policies that you're not allowed to drink anything after midnight. How many have heard of don't drink after midnight? How many have heard that? It's not evidence-based. The evidence says four hours. Why do they do eight to 12? Because they don't want anybody, they, they want to be overly cautious. So my point is this. If somebody drinks some fluid at three in the morning on the day they're going to have their surgery, don't freak out. It's, that's a silly way to cancel the surgery. Now you're going to have to tell the healthcare provider, but it, the surgery will probably still be the case, unless it's within four hours. And the reason why we don't want them to eat anything or drink anything four hours before surgery is so that if during surgery they have an emesis, they vomit, that their stomach is empty and they don't aspirate that in their lungs. So it's to prevent lung aspiration. That's why we want their stomach empty. Now, if somebody comes in and they need immediate surgery due to an auto accident, they, ju they, were, they just ate at a restaurant, they pull out onto 72, and they get side T-boned, and now they've got to be care flighted to the surgery, and they need surgery on their lungs and all legs and all kinds of stuff because of the trauma, but they just ate, what do you think we'll do? What did you learn in lab this semester do you think would be done? Yeah, we'll put down a nasogastric tube and we will empty their stomach, pump it out, so that there's nothing there. Now, rather than doing that for every surgical patient who's going in for a gallbladder, we just say don't eat, drink after midnight. How many people do you think would rather not eat or drink after midnight rather than have a tube put down in the morning in their stomach pump. OK, so yeah. OK, dietary modification. A lot of surgeries need uh, dietary modification. For example, gallbladder surgeries, you don't want them to eat any fatty meals for three days before surgery, because that makes the gallbladder hyperactive. And you don't want a hyperactive gallbladder when you remove it. Uh, some other bowel surgeries, I mean, bowel surgeries, you might have dietary modification. Bowel preparations are done a lot for orthopedic and uh, gynecological procedures. We don't do that much anymore. We used to, everybody had to have a clear bowel before they went to surgery because of the parasympathetic blockade that occurs 
and then the constipation that occurs afterward. But we have such good stool softeners and things now, we don't have to do that. So that the day of enemas is gone. Hallelujah. Okay. Uh, for both nurse and patient. Holding medications. When a person goes for surgery that morning, they should not get their oral medications. As a general rule, the NPO order means no oral meds either. However, there is one exception. Does anybody remember the exception? We talked about it with uh, certain types of diseases and their implications for surgery about a week and a half ago. Does anybody remember the one oral pill that a patient must take before surgery, even though they're NPO? For one extra credit point on an exam, is anybody willing to risk, risk a guess? Yes, Rebecca? Thyroid. Thyroid, exactly. Thyroid pills. Okay, the thyroid pills. And we could generalize that, Rebecca, to say hormones. Anytime it's a hormone preparation, they should have those before surgery. But all your other meds, your heart meds, your lung meds, your gut meds, your pain meds, all of those meds, your arthritis meds, they're all stopped the morning of surgery, but your hormone meds should be given. Yes, Courtney. Does that include like birth control? See, that, that's the thing. Bir she asked, what about people that are on birth control? Because, I mean, they're, you know, you're talking about millions taking birth control daily, and they're going for surgery. The, re the thought is because birth control does affect clotting, that we don't want to throw that off. So many health care providers, surgical health care providers, want them to take their birth control the morning of, because they don't want that clotting situation to be thrown off. They want it to be stable. Now, the reality is, is many of the people taking daily birth control pills, now I don't, I'm not an expert on this, so I don't really know. I'm talking from ignorance. But there are, most of the pills at a certain period are all dummy, dummies. They don't, they don't contain anything. They're just there so the person takes it daily, you know. Those are just fine. So since the chances that they would have an active ingredient that would be problematic during surgery is so low, they'll just say, take that pill. And it's very tiny. It's very small. It's not a big deal. Okay. So, um, but some surgeons say, no, I don't want them taking it. So that's going to be what I would call a surgical preference, whereas the thyroid, every surgeon is going to do that. All right. Uh, let's see. Administering medications. So we hold their routine meds. The meds they usually get, we hold them. However, there are some preoperative medications we give to everybody. And they're usually intramuscular or IV. Nowadays, they're IV. They're even getting to be where they're fluid oral. How many have seen pre-op patients given a little medicine cup of fluid or uh, liquid oral meds to take? How many have seen that? That's the big new thing now. As long as it's under one ounce, they don't care. But uh, inter intravenous injection. And I want you to write down the three meds that we give. I want you to write down the three medications we give. We give an anti-anxiety med. Remember those are called anxiolytics. Anxi for anxiety, lytic meaning breakdown, anxiolytic breaking down anxiety, anti-anxiety meds. These are mostly the pamelams. Do you guys know the pamelams? What are those? What are the pamelams? Anybody know the class? Benzodiazepines, is that familiar? Aprazolam, diazepam, fluazepam, clorazepam. These are anti-anxiety meds. Now, why would we give an anti-anxiety med pre-op? I talked about it a little bit in the first hour. Why would I give an anti? What's that? Sedative. Yes, because if they're at less anxious, when they go to the operating suite and the anesthesiologist goes to anesthetize them, it's going to take a much lower dose, 25% less anesthesia, if you use the anxiolytic benzodiazepine beforehand. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 
a muscle relaxant. Martin, why would they give them a muscle relaxant, antispasmodic? Uh, doesn't it allow you to have a lesser dose of anesthesia? Because what is a major muscle, skeletal kind of muscle, that would relax better having this drug that's of concern during surgery? Thinking about ventilating the patient more easily. Diaphragm. Your diaphragm. Right. So if we relax the diaphragm, it doesn't it make sense when that diaphragm is nice and relaxed, it's easier for the mechanical ventilator to inflate and deflate their lungs rather than if that diaphragm is all tensed up. So if you give the muscle relaxant before the surgery, the lungs are what we call more compliant. Does that make sense? More compliant to the ventilator. So you'll have to use lower volume, tidal volumes and rates to get better oxygen control. So that muscle relaxant is very, very important. And lastly, an anticholinergic. And the classic anticholinergic is atropine or scopolamine or robinol, those are your three big anticholinergics, cholinergics, robinol, scopolamine, atropine. You guys talked about anticholinergics, right? In pharmacology, you talked about atropine. Okay, what do they do? Anticholinergic, what does cholinergic mean? Courtney, what's cholinergic mean? Parasympathetic. So cholinergic equals parasympathetic. What does anti mean? Works against. So what does an anticholinergic do? It works against the parasympathetic. If it works against the parasympathetic, what effect does it have? Chloe Pitcher. So what general effect will it have? What do we call that? What branch of the autonomic are we talking about there? Sympathetic. Sympathetic. So if you work against the parasympathetic, you get the sympathetic. And as Chloe says, it makes your heart stimulated so that during surgery it doesn't stop. It stimulates your respiration so during surgery it doesn't stop. What does it do to the secretions in the, in the respiratory tree? Dries them up so that when they can't cough, that's okay because there's nothing to cough. You see, we don't want a bunch of mucus in a person who can't cough and gag. Does that make sense? So that dries them up. It also stops their bowel. So what do they not do on the table? <laughs> Defecate. And it stops their bladder. So what do they not do on the table? Urinate. Now, they will have a Foley catheter in, yes, guaranteed. But the point is, is during the stress of surgery, do, do you really want a lot of glucose and blood to be going to the gut and the urinary system? No, you want that be, to be going to the vital organs, the brain, the heart, and the lung, correct? So this puts them on the sympathetic setting and makes them adapt well to the stress of surgery. But, Laura, because it's the sympathetic, what do you end up with post-op that you talked about earlier? Yeah, the parasympathetic blockade. So there's two reasons why post-op patients have parasympathetic blockade. One is the stress of the surgery, which, which makes them sympathetic and the anticholinergic atropine we gave them pre-op, which doubles it and makes it even twice as bad. So it's a wonder anybody can urinate or defecate after surgery. It really is. And then add on, they're 95. And they've been abusing laxatives for two, 10 years. Okay, real problem. All right, so the, yes? Would the muscle relaxant have any effect Muscle relaxant, relaxant drug 
the, the anti, the muscle relaxant, see, because what's going to happen is in an anticholinergic, you're going to stimulate your skeletal muscle because that's the flight, fright, flight, fight. Remember that as sympathetic? The fight and the flight is going to get more blood to your skeletal muscles, okay? So we don't want them spasming because they're being stimulated by the sympathetic, right? So if we give a muscle relaxant, that will calm them down so that on the table you don't get reflexes. Now the smooth muscle is not affected by the muscle relaxants. The muscle relaxants are only for smooth, that's a good point. The muscle relaxant is not a smooth muscle or striated muscle relaxant. It's only a skeletal muscle relaxant, good point. And the good thing about the diaphragm is both skeletal and smooth, so it gets relaxed. Um, good question. Now, when do we get these in me medications? We give these medications about an hour before surgery, before they open, before the pa surgeon makes the incision. Because we want them to be well into their peak. So you do not give, in the morning of the surgery, you do not give these medications until the operating room calls you and tells you, give the meds. Because they know the schedule. See, the worst thing that you could do is give the meds at 7, and then everything gets delayed and the patient's surgery doesn't happen until noon. Has anyone had a family member whose surgery was scheduled at a certain time and it didn't happen until a, a three, four, five, six hours later? Yeah, okay, so don't give these meds until the surgical people say give them, and then you go give them as fast as you can. Well, as soon as the OR people tell you, give the pre-op meds, that becomes your priority. In other words, there's very, there are very few things that would be a higher priority for you at that moment than giving those pre-op meds at that moment. So if you're changing a bed, if you're going to give a pain med, if you're going to ambulate a patient, if you're going to give somebody a bath, or you're going to do some patient teaching, none of that would be as important as giving the pre-op meds when you're told to give them. So basically, it's drop everything and give your pre-op meds. Because they're counting on you giving them within five minutes of when they called you. So what, what, happened, what would you do if something came up and you couldn't give those pre-op meds? Let's say it's half hour's gone and craziness has happened. There have been two codes and somebody fell. And do you see what I'm saying? So what, what would you do? What would you do? Document and call. Document and call. Say, hey, look, no can do. And then they may have to reschedule the surgery. But that's better than you sending them down and the meds aren't either on board or haven't had a chance to work. All right, so that's real important. And another thing about these medications is you have to have the informed consent for the procedure signed by the patient before you give these meds. So Abigail. Why do you think that you must have the patient's consent for surgery signed before you can give these pre-op medications? Because they're going to become like more collapsed and out of it. Yeah, out of it means what? Their mental status is going to be changed and altered and decreased. And if anyone has a decreased mental status, they're not considered to be valid signers of a consent form. So that's, that's one of the worst things you can do is give the pre-op meds and then go, oh my, we've got to go get the, ins the informed consent sign. No, it's too late. Now you've got to wait till what? The medications wear off and then you've got to get the informed consent sign. That's going to be at least four hours. So now you've pretty much delayed surgery for an entire day, which who's going to eat that cost? The hospital, not Medicare, not the patient. So uh, your supervisors are going to be on your case for that one. Okay, skin preparation. Good news, guys. We used to have to shave people a lot because hair uh, has no, been known to harbor microorganisms and increase post-op infections in an area. If, if there's an incision here and there's hair near it, that increases the post-op infection. So we want that area of surgery hair-free. Nurses used to have to do that before surgery. But the problem is if you nick a person during surgery, just a tiny bitty little nick, that could cancel the surgery. So since nurses weren't as great at shaving people, 
a lot of people's surgeries were delayed because of nicking. So what they did was they, uh, about 15 years ago, they started developing the role of the OR tech. Have you heard of OR techs? They work in the surgical room only, and they do all the skin prepping, and they are good. You, a surgical prep could prep a whole person from here to here for chest surgery in like three minutes. They're just phenomenal without nicking. So all of that skin prepping is now delegated to the OR tech in surgery. So the patient won't even be conscious when you're doing the shaving. Okay, which is, and you won't even have to be doing it anymore, which is really, that's just really nice. It's one of the improvements that I really like in nursing. Okay, rest. Uh, make sure that they get enough rest. We used to uh, prescribe a lot of sleeping pills the night before surgery, back in the 80s and the 90s. We don't do that anymore because once you give them a sleeping pill, now the anesthesia has to counteract that. And, and you're just, you're undoing something that was unnecessary. Uh, electrolyte and fluid item balances must be corrected. You can't send people to surgery with hyper and hypokalemia. You have to correct that. Uh, removal of prostheses, we're talking about that. False teeth, they have to come out. Glass eyes have to come out. Um, Artificial limbs have to come off. Anything that can be removed should be removed. Now, you don't have to go after the pins in their hip replacement. No, now that would be a little overzealous. So you don't go, just the prosthetics you remove. Now, the big thing is make sure you document with two staff where they are and you put them under lock and key. And a lot of times you call security and have them deal with it because there's nothing worse than you losing a patient's prosthesis. I mean, it's just, you, you don't want to live through that. That is not a pleasant experience. Okay, and then there are vital signs, because remember, we're checking to see for stability. <coughs> all right, those are all things that we do before surgery. And most of those are done in the hours before. Emotional preparation may include listening to fears. We talked about that. And addressing concerns. We talked about that. Last topic I want to talk about today in pre-op is education of the client. And then we're done. We're finished. Teach what will be done in surgery and what will be expected after surgery. If you say, I don't know what to teach, Mark. I don't know what to teach. Here's what you teach. Teach what will be done in surgery and what will be expected after surgery. Two things. What are they going to do? And then what do I need to do afterward? It is really bad practice to teach patients what they need to do after surgery, after surgery. Because after surgery, now they're in pain, they're uncomfortable, uh, their, their mind is altered because of the anesthetic agent. And you're trying to teach them what they need to do. No, that should have, been done, should have been done beforehand. So all you have to do afterward is say, now remember how we talked about this. Now let's do this breathing machine here. And I want you to breathe in. Now I want you to blow out, you know, that kind of thing. Now is the time to teach any exercises or any protocols that the patient will be expected to perform post-operatively. The teaching should focus on what the patient will experience, that goes in the blank, what the patient will experience and what they are expected to do. Experience and action. Experience and action. Experiencing and doing. Those are the most helpful information. They did a study back in the 90s and it was corroborated in the 2000s with what pre-op teaching results in the best outcomes. And it was about what the patient will experience and what they will do. Teaching about what is going to happen is not as important. Like teaching Kylie about what we're going to do during brain surgery is not that helpful to the patient. But teaching her that when she comes out of surgery, she's not going to be able to see anything for a day. Don't you think that's important for her to know? Because if she didn't know that, and she knew exactly what was going to happen during surgery, she knew exactly what was going to happen during surgery, 
But when she came out of surgery, she didn't know she was going to be blind for 24 hours. Or versus you knew you were going to be blind for 24 hours, but you didn't know what was going to happen when they did the surgery. Which one would you rather know? You could only know one. Details about the surgery or that you weren't going to be able to see for 24 hours. <laughs> I think it's the, the experience. Uh, knowing that you're going to be hot, that you're going to be flushed, that you're going to be sweating that you're going to have throbbing pain, that you're not going to be able to move your toes, that you're not going to be able to, to walk. That you're, you see, all these things, the impact of, their, of the surgery on their experience is what's important. How many tubes are they going to have? What are they going to look like? They're going to wake up in the ICU maybe. What sounds will they hear? They're going to wake up in, their, in the, this room. See, they need to know, are we wake, am I going to wake up in this room right now? Or am I going to wake up in some other room? Because if they were told, if they weren't told you were going to wake up in ICU, they'll probably assume they're going to wake up where? In their room. That's what people would assume. I'm waking up in my room. So when they're not in their room, what do they think? What would you think? If you thought something, something's going on, something wrong happened. And then what happens to the anxiety? Then what happens to the post-op experience? And this, boom. So tell them. What are they going to see, hear, feel, taste, smell? You're going to see four nurses crowding around you with masks on <laughs> and, and, and goggles. And they're going to feel like this when they talk to you. You know, that type of thing. So they know what's going on. All right. Do this particularly with children. Particularly with children. One of the things they, they found out with children during research back in the, uh, I think it was 2014 and 15 in those years, the big thing with children when they were preparing children for surgical experiences, they would make videotapes and they would show, this is what's going to happen. And they would show people coming and it was taken from a POV, you know what I mean by POV? Point of view, like you had a, what, was those, what are those little cameras called? GoPro. GoPro. Like you had a GoPro on your forehead and it shows you your experience, how they wheel, you see the feeling as you're going down you see the elevator doors and then it, it showed that all that. And, and they found out that those videotapes reduce the anxiety and the fighting due to fear that little kids do after surgery. It reduces that greatly if the video shows exactly what they're going to experience. But they found that hospitals often buy stock videos made by Sinai Hospital in Los Angeles, not Children's Medical in Dayton. So in its point of view, when the kid, the video they're shown shows a ceiling that's white. But at Children's, it's blue. And the elevator is green on the video, but it's orange at Children's. So what happens to these kids? Chloe, what do you think? Chloe Vaughn, what do you think they do? They get anxious. Gerard, you have kids. What do you think they do? They get, they get very freaked out. Very, they sit up on the table. They stretch her. They, try, they get very anxious because they're not being taken where they said they were being taken to. Because kids take things very what? Literal. So yes, it's very important to tell children what they will experience. But please be sure it's 100% accurate. If you paint the walls, what do you have to do to the video? Reshoot it. <laughs> I'm serious. Or if you can go in and nowadays we can what? Edit colors and we have really nice capability now. But if you don't do it right, it's worse than doing not at all. And then what they're expected to do. So sensory, so here's the answer to that question. What's the most important pre-op teaching a nurse must do? Sensory information and post-op actions that the patient must do. Those are more important than any other instruction, even their meds. It'd be better to teach them that and forget to teach them their medication. And we have five minutes left, and we got about five minutes stuff here, so we'll finish up. The immediate pre-op sequence. Now, all those things I told you, all of those things I told you, how does it play out? The one thing I did not tell you about was the informed care.
consent. And I want you to write this in, informed consent. And it is a document that says, I, the patient, and they sign their name, agree for Dr. So-and-so, and the name goes in there, and associates to do the following procedure on me, and they fill in the procedure, on this date, and they fill in the date. So an informed consent has to have at least four things in it, the informed. The doctor's name, the patient's name, the surgical name, and the date. That informed consent has to have all four of those, or it is not valid. So if any of those is left blank, you as a nurse know that you cannot do surgery. Those have to be filled in. Now, informed consent means that the patient was informed about the surgery, the surgeon, the date, and what was going to happen. And then th that's their information. And then their signature is the consent. They're signing to more than just consenting. It's an informed consent. Now, if you assess that the patient gave consent, but they're not informed, do you hear what I said? If the patient gives consent, but they're not informed, you call the surgeon, and the surgeon must inform them. You do not inform them. Then you have them sign it again, and you witness their signature. Now, you will sign the informed consent, but your signature, and get this is a big thing I test on because it's so important. Your signature, a nurse's signature on an informed consent does not mean that you informed the patient. And it does not mean that you witnessed the informing. What it means is you witnessed them signing the form. So you're like a notary public. You're signing and validating that it was indeed the patient that signed the consent, not someone else. So all your signature is is a witness, and that's the important word, a witness that the patient themselves signed it. That's what your signature means. Now, that must be done at a specific time, informed consent. Now, if they're a minor, the parents do. If they're an emancipa emancipated minor, they do. OK, so here's the, here's the immediate pre-op sequence. The, imme the informed consent must be signed. You must do that before you do any preparation, because the preparation is considered to be part of the procedure. So you can't do the preparation without the informed consent. So the informed consent must be signed first. This is the responsibility of the surgeon. That's important. Underline that. It's the responsibility of the surgeon, but nurses are expected to be certain that the patient has signed the informed consent. It's not your responsibility, but if it's not done, you would take action to get it done. OK, then the next sentence. When the nurse signs an consent conform, it's only certifying that it was the patient, not that they were informed. So you sign the informed consent. Then, secondly, make sure all lab tests and results are on the chart. OK, then number three, it's not on here. Number, I don't believe it is. Number three, it might be. Let me make sure I, OK, number three. Make sure you do all of the physical and emotional preparation. All those things we just talked about. Make sure all of those are done. All physical and emotional preparation. And the neat thing about it, you'll have a checklist, everybody. You'll have a checklist that tells you everything to do. And it's great. So if you don't remember the order, it will be there. After you do that, <coughs> you have, you have the patient void, which means empty their bladder. Number five, you give them their pre-op medications, those pre-op meds that I talked about, number five. Number six, you put the side rails up and instruct them to never get out of bed until told to. That's why you want to have them void. You see, you don't want to have them, you don't want to give them medications and then have them get up and void because they could fall due to the, the benzodiazepine. So it's void, 
meds, side rails up, and then they stay in bed and await transport to the operating room. All righty? And that's the pre-op experience. Now tomorrow, not tomorrow, but Wednesday, we'll talk about the intra-op. And then on Monday, we'll talk about the post-op. Maybe that next Wednesday, a little bit of post-op. Then we'll decide, come Thursday, okay, deciding what you want to do with that extra day. All righty? Any questions? Yes, Courtney. Could we, like, email you about that, or will we talk about it in class? It might be nice if you emailed so I get it, so everybody can s voice their opinion without feeling coerced by a group. Not that you guys are coercive at all. All right. We will see. Oh, by the way, did I put the extra credit points from your assignment on the test. Did everybody see that? Okay. Yes? Yeah, there'll be a calculation quiz. Well, no, it'll be Monday. It'll be Monday. Because I want to go over what it what it covers. It's not gonna be a big deal. It's just a check to make sure that you can do math. That's basically all it is. All right, we'll see you guys.